Revelation chapter 2. Begin reading. Unto the angel, the church of Ephesus, right? These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews, and are not but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessel of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So here we're going to deal with first the first church that's being talked about here, and that's the church of Ephesus. <clears throat> but it's often said that this is a letter that is given directly unto the churches 
in Ephesus, and a message that was delivered unto them. But if you look, it says, unto the angel, or the messengers, or as I said, the pastors, or in that word, if you were to break it down, evangelist, that same idea is given, the angel, then the messenger, the, the portion, the person that was receiving it, then is somebody that is upon this earth. Um, this is a typical interpretation of the passage, and I think it fits that the angel then is a specific leader within the church. Um, it's not typical for a heavenly angel to need a message to be given unto him or to need letters to be sent unto him, but rather, typically, the heavenly angels are the ones delivering the message, and so I think that interpretation then fits, that the one that is receiving the message that came from an angel to John is a specific person, a specific man, a human that lives upon this earth or lived upon this earth at the time in which it was written. So then the angels then are the ones that are receiving, and that's specifically what the context says. It says, unto the angel of the church in, unto the angel of the church in, unto the angel of the church in. And so it's delivered and expressly given unto specifically the angel, the pastor, the leader in that specific church. Obviously, by extension, it would be to the church. But I, I, again, I don't say, nor do I think, what was commanded to write to the churches, as the title of my, uh, or the heading of my Bible says, specifically written to the church. I don't think that's the main context. It goes to the leaders first. It goes specifically by revelation to the angel. Notice then, and it continues, and that understanding holds true, because as you see the, the specific pronouns that are used, it says thy, 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 over again, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and it's talking specifically, and pointed specifically and directly at the one person being that angel in the context. So then the message, as it always is, is directed first at the messenger before it ever goes to those that are under the messenger or would hear it from the messenger. And think about it, it works the same way no matter who you are in leadership, no matter what type of messenger you are. We preach a gospel that we first were saved by. We first received it and now we can preach it. We preach precepts that have first been applied after being understood to our own hearts. So we have received the message, and now we can preach those same precepts. We preach commandments that we have first obeyed, and as we have obeyed them, so we preach them, lest we be a hypocrite that has a beam in our eye while trying to cast out motes. We also preach judgments that have reproved, rebuked, and exhorted us first before we delivered them. So in the same way, the angel here, the messenger, the preacher, is receiving the message from the angel, from John, through the pages of this book as it was received unto them, in order that they would secondarily deliver it unto others. But that's, I believe, what the context is. The angel. The angel is receiving it. Specifically the one that is saying, I know thy works, I know thy labor. Being the one man that is supposed to receive this and then pass it on. First Titus chapter 1. First Titus chapter 1, if you can go there. Keep your finger in Revelation chapter 2. First Titus chapter 1. There is no first Titus. First Timothy chapter one. And in verse first Timothy one. And in verse twelve, the Bible reads, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. The Apostle Paul here writing, in reflection of Christ giving the ministry that he counted specifically the Apostle Paul for. And he put him there. He gives glory and thanks unto Christ that revealed that same message unto him, that called him unto that purpose and put him into the ministry that he has. Verse 13 says, Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So here the Apostle Paul was a recipient 
of the same mercy and grace that he extends unto others. We know in his, his, his direction or in his introduction to people, he'd always say, grace and mercy and peace be unto you. Grace and mercy be unto you. And here he's pointed out specifically, the only way he can deliver grace and mercy is that he received it first, was enabled in the ministry that he was getting to be a preacher of the same truths that he received. He obtained mercy because he did what he did in ignorance and in unbelief. And that grace exceeding abundant came upon him through the faith and love which is in Christ Jesus specifically. Verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all unsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Here the Apostle Paul is reflecting about the fact that he received the ministry through the mercy and grace of the Father. And he says that saying that Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief for this cause. That in me first, it says in verse 16, in me first, Christ is showing what? His long suffering. Why did he do that? For a pattern to those that would believe on the apostle Paul's preaching of him afterwards. To the ones that would believe on Jesus Christ unto everlasting through the preaching of Paul. And it had to come by vehicle or by way of the apostle Paul in him first receiving the same message. And so we see that same thing play out in the book of Revelation where the preacher, the angel, receives it first in order that he might pass it on. We talked about that last week as well, the order of things, how the glory is, is partitioned and given out to people in various degrees of understanding. But this isn't negating the fact that everyone has access to the same glory. Everyone is called to the same ministry, and that's the ministry of reconciliation. Everyone is called to be preachers, but how can you be a preacher unless you've first heard the same preaching that you're going to give to others. You need to understand the truth after receiving the truth. That's being saved. Then you can lead others to that same salvation. That's what the Apostle Paul is highlighting. He says, my ministry came by grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. I was a sinner and the chiefest of them, but in me first he showed forth his salvation for a pattern to those after that should follow in my steps unto that same salvation. So, Jesus Christ is showing his patience in the Apostle Paul that the Apostle Paul would minister of the same. What are we saying here? Well, that the messenger must first receive of the message that he's delivered before he can adequately and faithfully give it unto others. Go back to Revelation chapter 2. So this isn't like a, a lifestyle evangelism that we're preaching. In other words, you must always live the things that you're preaching and show them forth in such a way that they're God's will. But... We need to understand that the message that is received from the Word of God, while it is not commanded for salvation, the message ought to have some sort of impact in your life, especially if you're going to take the ministry that you are called to with any kind of seriousness, with any kind of sobriety. So we are all ordered unto good works. We are all to follow in the good works that are prescribed, right? By grace you saved through faith, not of yourselves as a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we should walk in the statutes as we're receiving them. We should walk in the truths of the Bible as they're expounded upon unto us. As God gives revelation, we should take the revelation, apply the revelation, and walk in the same revelation. Because that's the only way that you're going to be an effective minister. The Apostle Paul highlighted that the same. He said, in me first the truth was shown out that I might show others the pattern that they ought to fall into. He had a lifestyle that reflected the preaching that he had. And we need to understand as messengers, as angels, whether that revelation came first to one man who was the pastor, who was the bishop, who was the preacher of Ephesus, he needed to receive it first, understand that God knows his works, God knows his labor, God knows his patience, and there are somewhat things that God has against the man in order that he would then be able to pronounce it and proclaim it properly unto others. So the angels and the messenger here you'll find in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 are being encouraged 
personally and on a personal level to be um, to, to be getting in line with the preaching that's coming to them. They're being encouraged and exhorted and rebuked. They're being provoked unto love, provoked unto good works, that they might do them, that they might live in them, specifically by the preaching of Jesus Christ, the revelation that came unto him through the angel, through the word of God, and was received unto them. They're expected to perform these things before they pass these same things on to others. Yes, these truths came unto the churches. Here we are as a church, reading and beholding them today. But primarily, there was a target, there was a focus, and it was on the leadership. It was on the recipient specifically at this time, the angel of the church, the angel of the church. Verse 1 says this, it says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of of the seven golden candlesticks. We already talked about this last week. That's Jesus Christ walking in the midst of the churches. He is holding in his hand, in his right hand, the angels, the messengers of those churches as he walks within the center of the churches, in the midst of them. And I'm so thankful that even today Christ walks in the midst of our church. We are all as little lights shining, reflecting the glory that he has only because he is here in the midst. People will often say, you don't need church to meet with God. I hear that with people all the time. Because uh, we go to the door and we first invite them to church in a way of trying to figure out where they're at, if they have a religious background or not, seeing if they would be open to joining us for a service or not. Just kind of a gauge, an icebreaker, if you will. We'll ask them that question. And I've often heard people say, ah, you don't need church to, to have a relationship with God, to meet with God. I prefer to meet with God when I go out hunting in the woods or when I'm walking in a field or when I'm in a forest or whether I'm, I'm on, on a mountaintop. People have all these different ways. And, and it's true. You, you don't need to go to church to meet with God because I do it all the time. I'm not here most of the week. I'm other places and I'm meeting with God. But specifically, and what they're missing is the fact that here he is in the midst. It's been revealed unto us that in specific regard to these seven churches, and I believe it extends unto us because where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst, and that's specifically in the context of prayer. But God finds his way to dwell in the midst of the churches, and while you don't need to come to the midst of the church to hear from him, our church time is precious. Our opportunity to meet with Christ here is precious. And I believe not only that, it is commanded. And so we ought to do what is commanded of us. And quite often, as it always does, what's commanded is always what's best for us. So people will say, yeah, I don't need to go to church to meet with God. And I say, well, I get to go to church and that's where I meet with God. Portion of my week is dedicated, is devoted, is precious commodities to come here where God promises he will be in the midst. And this is where we're encouraged. This is where we're edified. This is where we're strengthened. And the people that make those lame brains excuses about why they don't go to church or why they don't go to the best church or why, why they miss church, it, 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 it comes from a place of just unbelief and ignorance of the fact that, hey, God is here and waiting to commune with you. God wants to meet with us here. That's why he paid for the church with his own precious blood. It's precious to him. It's special to him. <clears throat> Verse 2 says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them Liar. So here Christ is pointing out to the angel specifically that he knows his works. He knows his labor. He knows his patience. He knows his spiritual discernment. And the interesting thing about this is when you're standing before a God that knows all things, not only does he know what's done in these areas, he also knows what's the heart of the matter of these areas. This is a problem that many Christians come upon is that they will do the works. They will do the labor. They will show patience in public. They will have discernment. And they will always find out who is wrong and who is not an apostle. And they'll expose them. But what's the heart of the matter of all of these instances? 
People can do good works and outwardly show that they're doing good works with a completely wicked heart that's just out to gratify self and to puff self up and to say, look how good I am, look how awesome I am. People can labor. They can come and they can be here on a church day and they can be the one that's hardest cleaning, the one that's doing the most work and set up and take down. And it's all just to puff up self and to say, look how much I can do. Look how great I am. Patience, right? We can all have patience at time when all I have to do is deal with brother so-and-so and sister who's it for about 20 minutes. I can really show my patience. Look how patient and enduring I am with him. But my heart is just screaming inside of me. I, I gotta get out of here. This is driving me nuts. And then I go home and I complain and I fit and I, and I you know, I'm all upset, right? My heart wasn't right in that thing. And the same thing in regard to discernment and to knowing those that are apostles and, and are not and exposing the truth and exposing the lies and finding them that are evil and not bearing with them can be done from a heart that is not right with God. God is a God of truth and God wants the light to shine in darkness, the darkness not comprehended, and he wants error and wickedness and evil to come to the surface. But so many people will set up these discernment ministries where they spend their entire life just walking around talking about how this guy's wrong and that guy's wrong and that brother's in error and this guy's wicked and that guy's wrong. And you never hear any of them actually learning from the scriptures and telling us, well, what is right then? If all these guys are wrong, what is right? And so here Christ points out, I know your works. I know your labor, I know your patience, I know your discernment, but I also know your motive in each one of these areas. And you can be the most stunning and upright and wonderful Christian from the outside and inside just be full of dead man's bones. The Pharisees were professional at this. They looked on the outward, their cup was clean, but inside it was full of riot and excess and unruliness and filth. And that's the problem that we need to come to and, and, and fix. We need to understand that God knows all these things, but he also knows beyond what other people know. And that, that is what is being pointed out here. Christ just got finished saying that I am the Alpha, I am the Omega, I am the beginning, I am the end. I am far beyond your comprehension. I know your works, I know your labor, I know everything, even your heart, in the matter of the works that you do. In the area of discernment, we can talk about that more, but we know in 1 John that we talked about trying the spirits which are of God and which are of error. And this is a good thing, and this is one good point and a highlight that comes to, comes to the surface when Christ is talking specifically about the angel of the church of Ephesus. He says, hey, I know your works, great. I know your labor, I know your patience. And he says, I know that thou canst not bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they're apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And that is a vi viable ministry. That is a good thing for a leader to be able to do, to be able to discern between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, the spirit of God and the spirit of, of, of not God, of error, of wickedness, of antichrist. This angel then, this messenger, this preacher was able to discern it and he didn't bear with it. And so the same thing needs to be done within the context of our lives. If we could look at what this preacher did right, we could see, hey, he was a hard worker, he was laborious, he was patient, and he didn't bear with them that were evil. He found out those that were evil did not bear with them. But patience also has its, its position in this. And so some people will get the idea that we just need to pitch everybody. But I believe that there's a very different thing between somebody who is bearing error and someone who is bringing error. Second John says, if they bring unto you a false gospel, receive them not, neither bid them God speak. Right? Get out of here. Good riddance. Don't come back with your false preaching. Right? But there's a difference between somebody bringing error and somebody just bearing with it. Right? There's a lot of areas where we can grow in patience with people that don't just have everything figured out. Just because I know so much about the scriptures doesn't mean I need to beat up on, attack on, and hate on people that don't know as much. People will come with all sorts of confusion and, and misunderstandings, and, and, and they will enter into our church. They might even talk about these things, but if we're appropriate, if we're kind, if we're compassionate, some have compassion making a difference, others save with fear, pulling out of the fire, and doing those proper steps in patience towards the people, then we will be fulfilling 
what the Bible says in due course. Again, some people think it's just a matter of you're wrong and just throwing them out of the church and you're wicked and throwing them, exposing them to everybody. I don't ever plan to make a whole ministry out of that. That recently just got me in trouble, but I don't regret what I did because that's probably about 5% of what happens here. You all bear witness that I don't stand up here and just rip on this guy and that guy and he's wrong and he's wrong. I like to highlight truth, but if somebody being in error will help me as an illustration to provide a truth from the scriptures, I will do it. If somebody needs to be marked, I will mark them. There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to do what 2 Timothy in chapter 2 verse 25 says. It says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance unto the acknowledging of the truth. So there's kind of your litmus test for someone bringing error and someone bearing error. The bringer of error is somebody that's teaching these things. They're very vocal. They're very, they're very public about their teaching, their bringing of error. Somebody was to walk in here, as we've experienced, and start bringing error and confusion and contempt for leadership and, and, and trying to break down the things and trying to, ex, trying to say their own way, their own purposes, their own plan, their own ideals of how things should be going. They are bringing error and they need to be removed. I'm not going to bear with that. I'm going to put that away. But if somebody comes and they just have error upon them because they've learned wrong, they've grown up wrong, they're a part of such and such a religion, they grew up with this mindset, they're just confused and they're just bearing error. We need to have the opposite effect where instead of just casting these people to the streets, and we've experienced the same thing. Somebody came in and they had a wrong understanding of scriptures. They were not saved, but we in meekness instructed those that opposed themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance into the acknowledging of the truth. We didn't throw that person out on their backside and say, get out of here and you believe, repent of your sins. No, we long suffered, we were patient, we bore with the arrow and we tried to nurture them through the scriptures unto a right belief. Maybe, peradventure, God will give them the repentance and they will acknowledge the truth. But this is the kind of thing that we need to understand. And this is the kind of thing that the angel in Ephesus understood. He had a discernment for when was time to be patient. He had a discernment for when it was time to not bear with the error. And this is something that I need to learn. This is something we all need to learn to help people to grow and help people to reach a point where they can understand. And then if they've proven themselves to be an error and they start promoting it, fine, we'll cast them away. We'll cast them aside. That's no problem. I have absolutely no problem with that. But most of the people that will come across that will even enter and darken the doors of our church are not coming here specifically to bring error. They may be in error, but there's a difference. There's a discernment that needs to be taking place. We need to understand the time and the place for those things. There's a time to love, there's a time to hate, right? That's what the Bible teaches, and we need to apply those same things. This angel then, it was as was his job, he knew and he discerned and he judged and he executed based on his understanding of the scriptures and what had been revealed unto him. You can keep your finger there, and if you want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. And we'll get a little bit of an understanding of, of the role of a judge. The role of a judge. Which was a great thing that we saw and a, and a great compliment that was received. He, Jesus said, Hear of the angel of the church of Ephesus, thou dost not bear with them that are evil. Those that, those that bring error. Those that are wrong. You expose them. You've judged them not apostles. you found them liars. And that was the ministry that was given to specifically the judges. In Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 9, Deuteronomy 1 and verse 9, the Bible says, And I spake unto you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. Now we know that this is Moses talking. And here he's almost like a picture of Christ. He had heard from his stepfather Jethro, which would be like the father, revealing unto the son that you were not able to bear these alone. So what was he to do at this time? He was not able to bear them alone. So the Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold ye are this day as stars of heaven for multitude. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times and many more as ye are, and bless you as he hath promised you. How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife. So Moses here has a lot going on. And again, I'm not limiting Jesus Christ, but what is the understanding here is that Jesus isn't, he, he had a church of 100, he had a church of 12, at one time it was 150. He had 1,000 that had come and go, 5,000 at one point that he fed. He had great congregations that swelled and that were restricted. 
But ultimately, in the end, when he ascended up on high, he didn't continue to just manage all of these churches. Even as Moses is being exhorted not to just manage all of the cumbrance, the burden, the strife of all the things that men need to go on. So what did they do? He set forth, as it says in verse 13, take you wise men and understanding and known among your tribes. So they were known among the people. They were wise among the groups. They were understanding among the groups. And I will make them rulers over you. And he answered me and said, the thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do. So the people were understanding of it. Here is Christ. He's ascended up on high. He bought the church. And now, as we see Moses doing, he sets forth out of the tribes, people that were known in the tribes, that were wise, that were understanding, and he set them as rulers. Isn't this the same as Christ has done with the angels, with the preachers, with the pastors, with the bishops, with the teachers, with the overseers, all of those ministries that were given with a specific purpose to bear what? The cumbrance, the burden, and the strife of all that's going on in Egypt. Each group in each area in each tribe the people here answered and said yeah that is a good thing to do and this is a little bit like the church is right now so I took the chief of your tribes wise men and known and made them heads over you captains over thousands captains over hundreds and captains over fifties and captains over tens and officers among your tribe and I charged your judges at that time saying hear the causes between your brethren and judge righteously between every man and his brother so then the position is given of judge and their responsibility as chief of the tribes over thousands hundreds fifties right leadership being appointed for these different areas with judges where their specific responsibility is here to hear and judge righteously hear the causes judge righteously between his brother but also this and the stranger that is with him so here just as the angel in the church of ephesus was receiving was the exhortation that he is doing this well as a judge he is hearing the causes and judging righteously he is confirming those that are apostles and those that are not finding them liars he has patience he has borne he has long suffered he has labored with them and verse 17 says you shall not respect persons in judgment but you shall hear the small as well as the great you shall not be afraid of the face of man for the judgment is god's and the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me and I will hear them. I commanded you at this time all things which ye should do. So here the judge is giving the final authority to take what's being taught within the law and apply it to every man. And when things are too hard, he goes to the supreme judge, which for us would be the law, and above that would be Christ, and he will judge the call for us. And so here, it's just a portion of scriptures that highlights the ministry of the judges, the overseers that are given over each individual tribe and portions of that tribe. And would to God, and we, we would have more of what's going on here. A tribe is given. So here's the tribe of Ontario. And within that tribe of Ontario, there's heads of thousands, heads of hundreds, heads of fifties, heads of tens, and officers among them all. That's a perfect description of how it should be over here. We have the tribe of Ontario, and within it, there ought to be an angel over a thousand, and an angel over fifty, and an angel over revealing different churches that are going on. And within those churches, specifically judges that know the law, and they're able to judge righteously. And I believe that that would base, basically be best appropriate to, especially within a group of ten, especially within a group of 20 or 50 or a smaller amount that can be given unto the specific chief wise man known among them that can execute such speedy judgment and appropriately not having respective persons back in revelation chapter 2 i believe that's exactly the commendation that's being given unto the angel in the church of ephesus he has been a hard worker. He has labored. He has patience. He can't bear them that are evil, but has judged them and found them liars. But even still, he has borne. He has patience, in verse 3, and for my name's sake has labored and has not 
fainted. And I'm learning more and more that in the, in the position where I stand as an angel, as a messenger, as a leader, that as these problems and these situations come at me and as people come to me with their various concerns and their various contentions, their various strifes, and all the things that Moses at one time was overlooking all upon him, I'm representing and recognizing more and more why Christ would even appoint a person like me is because he wants for the leader to have management over, have care over, have love over, have compassion over, work with, strengthen, bear, have patience for, love, labor, and not faint for the people that he has given him to oversee. God gives specific purpose to the angel, the church of the Ephesians here to have that responsibility. And here he's being con com commended for having the same and for upholding it at a red level. He says, I have seen that you have borne. I have seen your patience. I have seen that for my name's sake, for the name of Jesus Christ, you have labored and you have not fainted. He is doing very well in the role that he has, we find in verse 3. It continues in verse 4, though. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember there from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. So this is one of those cases where they're doing, the Lord is doing the sandwich effect. He's going to come and he's going to give a positive. And if you're ever in leadership, you should try this. Give a positive, give the negative, and reinforce that with a positive, right? The meat is the negative about your, your person you're overseeing. You can do that with children as well. Hey, son, I really like how you did this, but you did this not right. It was sloppy. I didn't appreciate it. But hey, I noticed that you're a hard worker. You're going to do it better next time, right? The sandwich effect is what's being trade portrayed here as God points out that, hey, you've worked hard, you've labored, you're being patient, you can't spare them that are evil, you're throwing them out, you're, you're doing all the right things, you you're, have not fainted in the work that you are doing, you are long-suffering and striving. Nevertheless, you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence that are fallen, and repent and do the first works. In other words, he is able now to reflect upon what he had left and do it again. He's not gone so far, and this is another act of grace that God puts upon his angel at this time. He didn't let him go so far as to where he wouldn't even see where he had fallen from, where he would just hit rock bottom and be destroyed. But no, God steps in, compliments the leader, and then says, I have somewhat against thee. You have left your first love. Remember it. Remember where you've fallen from and do the first works. Repent and do the first works works. The first thing I want to point out here is that he left the first works. A lot of people will misquote this and they'll say, I lost my first love. I lost my first love. You'll, 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 hear, you'll hear married people do this all the time. Oh, I fell out of love with my spouse. I, I don't love my spouse anymore. I, I lost my love for them. And a good question for that person, if you're not loving your wife, who's lo whose wife are you loving, right? You, you, you catch the fact that, that that's just a cop-out to say that I have lost Something. In other words, it wasn't my fault. It just, it just disappeared. I don't know where it went. I lost my first love. But the Bible here says I left it. It was purposeful. It was pointed. There was, there was an intent to turn from it and to leave it behind. I lost. No, you left your first love. This points out that love is something that, that, that needs to be worked at. You need to keep on love, and you need to dedicate yourself to love. You need to work at love. You need to hold to love. You need to not quit on love. This says in verse 3, regarding love, you should born. You should have born. You should have patience. You should have labor, for Christ's sake. You should have not fainted in these things. And this is exactly the type of compliments that God is giving to the leader here, to the angel, that he should have applied also to love, to the first love. You shouldn't have left it. You shouldn't have walked away from it. You should have had the same hard work, the same labor, the same patience, and the same bearing without fainting that you have in the entirety of your ministry. You should have applied it to the first love. You should have applied it to this thing. Here the angel we see had the works. They had the patience. They had the labor. They had the judgment. But they left the first love. They left that. They walked away from it. They didn't take the same hard work that they have applied to everything and the patience and the labor specifically to the first love. Now some people will say that the first love here is soul winning. 
Because this was one of the first things that Jesus Christ commanded. Jesus Christ, specifically after he had resurrected, said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel and every creature. He promised to endue them with power from on high. He promised that they would also go forth and baptize all nations and that they would continue in these things. Right? But, along with that commission, I will challenge that that wasn't necessarily the first love or the first ministry, the primary ministry that, that the whole of Christ's um, desire was for. Okay, His first position, his first desire was to step out of heaven as God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It, that was his grand purpose was to come to this earth that men might be saved. And so you would think that our first command or our first commission and our first works would then be to continue in that vein. And I partially believe that to be so. That is part of the whole truth. He taught many other first principles that we would see. You know, if you were to look at the beginnings of his teaching, the beginnings of his birth. After he was baptized, after he came up and was tempted of the devil, he didn't come out right away and begin to tell people about, about preaching the gospel, about, about going into all the world. That's a direct ministry of the church. But regarding, again, we're not talking about the church, but here we're talking about a specific man. I know thy works, I know thy patience, I know thy labor. Remember thy first love. Love. You forgot. You left thy first love. And his first love isn't necessarily to go and reach the people. Well, then what is it? Well, it's some of these first principles that Christ taught. And, it, and it's an overwhelmingly, abundantly bigger thing than soul winning. That is part of the package. That is part of the perfect Christian. But think of the Beatitudes. Think, think of the things that Christ came out and taught about, about not lusting after other people's wives, about, about blessed are ye, about blessed are ye, about blessed are ye, the poor in the kingdom, they that mourn, they that, they that are meek, be merciful, be pure in heart, be peacemakers. He's given a picture of a big package, and I believe it all stems from one thing. Go to John chapter 6. Again, I'm not going to try to negate soul winning, but I'm, not, I'm also not going to let people get away with it. I've seen this too many times. People that think, oh, the first loves is just soul winning. And they're rotten, stinking, good-for-nothing Christians, but oh, they go soul winning every week. They're never in church. They're never reading their Bible. They're never, they're never praying and ministering unto people. They're never doing the package that comes with being a Christian. How about this being a good father? How about, how about seeking to be a godly husband? How about being a good wife? How about the big picture package that a Christian ought to be, but all day soul win, so I've got my first loves. No, that, that, that is missing a big and broad picture of what the first loves and the first works are. Are. We're, 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 we're restricting it when we say that that's all it is. In John chapter 6, and in verse 25, John chapter 6 and verse 25, it says, And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when comest thou hither? So Jesus had walked away for a time, and they came to the other side of the sea, and they had found him there, and they said, When comest thou hither? Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. So here it wasn't because they saw Jesus do great things and great miracles and great wonders that they came and they sought unto him. Here it was because they wanted to gratify their flesh. He, it was a good meal. It was a free dinner. It's like the guys that stand on the street corner or at the intersection when you're trying to go pass on by. They're, they're after the cheap meal. They're after the free handouts. They're after something that would satisfy their stomachs, that would fill their bellies, which is their God ultimately right? You seek me not because you saw the miracles, not because you saw me as a great man. You saw me as the great God. You saw me as the King of Kings. You saw me as God in the flesh. No, you seek me because you're hungry and you want me to fill your belly again. Verse 27 says, labor not. So here's a work. Here's a labor that's going to be done. He says, labor not for the meat which perisheth. So they made the great length, the great strides. They walked a thousand miles around this entire lake to get the meat that perisheth, but, don't labor for that, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you, shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So don't labor for the meat which perisheth, but labor for the enduring meat, for something of eternal substance, for the gold, the silver, the stones. What are these things that we can labor for that will not perish? Souls, right? That is one of them. That is a portion of the first works. How about this? 
Helping others, just, just being a general blessing, encouraging, strengthening, lifting up other believers. Discipleship. How about raising godly seed, raising up children that will be the next generation, that will raise up godly seed that will be the next generation unto a thousand generations. That's why God called out Abraham specifically and said, I know him, that's why I'm going to reveal my truth unto him. He will command his children after him and after him and after and after him. And other things of eternal substance, how about just growing the church, working hard, laboring within the church, that you can see souls saved, yes, but also just the general and mundane things that have to go on around here. The setup, the tear down, the encouragement, the, the love, the, the follow up, the calling people when they're not showing up. Just the general things that need to go on. These are all items that you can labor in that have eternal substance. That's the eternal meat that does not perish. This is what Christ is highlighting here. Then said they unto him, verse 28, What shall we do that we might work the works of God. So here they're saying, okay, I'm going to labor. There's all these things that I have to do. And, and he's saying I'm laboring for something that's perishing, but he's saying that there's something that endureth unto everlasting life. There's another labor. There's another work. So what must we do to work the works of God? And verse 29 says, Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And this is the focus. This is the work of God. What is it? It's faith. It's believing on him. This is the first work. This is the first love. This is the first appropriated response to what God did when he left this earth and gave us the commission. It was that we would believe him. What was his commission? But, but another statement of his word. And when we receive the word that says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature, we need to receive that word in the same way we receive any word. We need to believe it by faith. Believe on him whom the Father hath sent and trust him to move forward. This is the work of God. The work of God is that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And this, I believe, is the big picture of the works of God. It's not just like some people will do and they don't go to church. And they sit at home and they just listen to sermons online. And they don't read their Bibles and they don't pray and they do anything. But they're out sowing six hours a week. And at the end of the, at the, end of the day, they're going to report, we saw this many saved. We, we're going to stand up. We're going to shout for glory. We're just going to say, look at us. Look at me. Look at me. But they're missing the portion because they'll say, oh, well, I have the first works. I have the first love. Therefore, I am the first Christian. Primo, cream of the crop, the best type of Christian. No, you're missing out on the works of God, which is to believe on him, to have faith in him, to trust in him. As we learned about in 1 John, believe that you may believe. Believe that you may believe, right? Ever wondered why there's those two belief statements in the same thing? These things that are written unto you that believe, why? That you may believe. Take the next step of faith after you've believed and trusted upon him. Don't just rest there. Believe and do the works unto everlasting life. Labor for the meat which endureth unto the same, and God shall give you of the reward. And where does it start? Where do the works start? What are the works of God, they ask? Believe on him. Trust in him. Grow in him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So if you're not doing your soul winning of faith, are you pleasing God? Eh, no, you're just going through a routine. You're just going through a fleshly carnal work. You are just doing, you're reading scriptures and the power is all in them. And you're receiving nothing of a reward that God promises to those that do the same, labor in the same of faith unto everlasting life, believing on Jesus Christ that saved it. The Bible says in Romans 14 and verse 23, Whoso, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So if you're going out and you're doing soul winning and you're doing, oh, I'm doing my first works, but it's not of faith, what is it? It's sin unto you. It's, it's not right. Before God, you are breaking his commandments and his commandments are not grievous, but his commandments start with faith. Believing him, trusting him, moving forward in that faith and allowing for him to do the works through you. And when you allow and labor with Christ unto everlasting life, you will find there is more than, instead of just wood, hay, and stubble, you're going to find there's gold, silver, precious stones, bread which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you in that day. These are the first works. This is where we need to start. These are the works of God that we're missing when we just say, well, if I just... Go soul. And you can fill in the blanks. This isn't just one, but this is the one I see most commonly. People that don't go to church, but they'll report their soul winning numbers on Facebook and think that they're pleasing God. They're not doing it of faith. Can you imagine somebody sitting at home and not going soul winning, actually receiving a greater eternal life gift? 
than somebody that is going out and doing soul winning completely within the carnality of their own fleshly desires. It happens. There are people that are laid up, that are hurting, that are sick, that are tired, that literally cannot get themselves up to go out, that are receiving more rewards. Why? What are they doing? Well, maybe they're praying. Maybe they're helping others along. Maybe they're making a call to encourage a Christian. Maybe they're trying to raise their family in the right way. There's all sorts of ways that they are doing things of faith, and they're receiving a faith-given reward. But then the people that show up in the tie go to the events, do the soul winning. Have the biggest Bible. Those are just carnal outward shoes of the flesh. And that is exactly the difference that you saw in the Pharisees. They're making a vain shoe in the flesh and they're receiving nothing of eternal consequence nor reward. It continues on in verse 35. <clears throat> and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. As they asked him... Give us bread. Give us bread. It was just what he finished talking about. He said, he said hey, you, you, you guys came here just because you wanted food. And they're like, okay, I get it. They're like, labor for something of eternal consequence. And it starts by believing on me. Believing on the Father that hath sent me. And they said, okay, I get it. Give me bread. <laughs> uh, I am the bread. I am the bread. Verse 35. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. And you can see them standing there with their stomachs grumbling and being like, I'm, I'm hungry, but where do you, what, 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 what are you talking about? Give me bread. I came here for bread. And Jesus is saying, hey, there is a bread that endures. What is the bread that endures? It is me. Believe on him whom the Father hath sent. And they still didn't get it. And here was the great divide. Here was the great struggle point. Here was the problem that these disciples had and these would-be disciples and these naysayers and these that have fallen short and all of the different people and the multitudes that had flooded and flocked and came to see him, not for his miracles, but for his bread. Here was the problem. Verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. They are spirit and they are life. What is it? The words that I speak unto you. He is highlighting the fact you guys are not getting it. I am telling you that you need to believe on me. I am giving you the bread of God. I am giving you the bread of life. I am giving you myself and you just keep focusing on the flesh and the flesh will profit you nothing. Zip. Zero. Zilch, go and labor, go and toil, go and struggle and strive and do all the Christian works you can do. If you're not doing it of faith, if you are do, doing it in the flesh, it profits you nothing. Yeah, you'll probably have some accolades. Yeah, you'll, you'll, just like the Pharisees that prayed in public that they may be seen of men, you'll have the glory of men. Look at this man. What a wonderful man. Look at all his soul and nerves. He's praying. What a glorious prayer that was. Wonderful. But in the long line of everlasting life, there will be nothing to profit. There will be nothing to show for the works that are done. Those spiritual in nature... There will be nothing to show for them if they're done in the flesh, if they're not done in faith. And that's what I believe is the first works. And this is why he highlighted the point. If you go back to Revelation, go back to Revelation chapter 2. This is why he highlighted the point. And in his compliment unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, he said, I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience. I know you can't spare them, so you have discernment in these areas. You have borne. You have patience. For my name's sake, you have labored and have not fainted. You're working. You're diligently. You're struggling. You're striving. You're doing all the things that I want you to do. Nevertheless, you are not doing it in faith. You are not doing it believing on me. You are not doing the first love and the first works because you left them behind. And this is the problem that we will face as a church because we are really good at doing works. We are really adept. We, this is the whole foundation of this church is going out and soul winning and serving and ministering and fighting for lost souls out there. But we can get to the point as he did where God will say, Soundwords Baptist Church, I know your works. I know you're out there every Saturday. I know you're out there every Sunday you can be. I know you're doing all these things. You're seeing people come to Christ. You're patient with people. You're laboring for people. You're bearing people. You have not fainted. You're doing it. You're doing it. You're doing it. 
you left doing it by faith. And this is, the, this is the trouble. This is the struggle. This is the problem that we can have is because we'll start to report our numbers of how much we're doing, and suddenly that becomes the goal. Well, what should the goal of all this be? The goal should always be Christ, right? Bread, 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 bread. Look at all these souls. Look at all these numbers. Bread, bread. All right, we've got lots of bread. And Jesus said, I'm the bread. We should be seeking after something enduring, something eternal. Why? Because these numbers may dry up. We may lose track of them. We may not have them. And even though we keep working, we need to understand that that's not the focus. The focus is Christ. It's always going to be Christ. It's always going to be pleasing Him. It's always going to be laboring for the things which endure unto everlasting life. And I believe that was the charge that was given specifically to this angel, to this preacher, to this pastor that he would then distribute to the church, was that, hey, I see you're doing great works. Hey, I see you're laboring. Hey, I see you're being patient. You're bearing. You're not fainted. Keep at it. But do it in faith. Do it believing. The first works, you left them. The first love, you left them. Remember. Repent. Come back to it. What was it? It was a position where you believed in the message so much because that message changed you and you went in that same vein. What will happen is that the message just becomes a vain repetition in our minds and we just go... Turn to Romans chapter 3, 23, turn to Romans 3, 10, turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and 8, 9, John 3, 16, bow your head and pray, next, boom, bread, right? And we're just always getting that carnal bread. And if we get into that mindset where we're constantly doing it, in the flesh, it will profit us nothing. The flesh profiteth us nothing. The flesh profiteth nothing. There is a whole group called the Pharisees, and that's all they did was vain shoes in the flesh. They, they looked more spiritual and more religious and more upright than any of the apostles. But all of their works they did for to be seen of men, therefore there was no profit in them. Most of them did not believe on Christ, and even less of them took the belief on Christ and believed unto everlasting life and did works that followed. The works come from, again, not a show of the salvation that's in me, but from another faith position. I believed on Christ. Now I'm going to believe on Christ, and he's going to work in me these other things. I'm going to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Faith unto faith unto faith unto faith and walking in that position. That is the first love. The first love is Christ and believing in him. The first works are Christ and believing in him. Believe, 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 trust, 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 and move forward in that. You see how, how taking that first works and just saying, well, that's soul winning. First love and that's soul winning. How that limits the message that's being taught here. The message is so much bigger. Because it's so much more than just going out soul winning on Saturdays. How about going soul winning at the grocery store? How about going soul winning at the laundromat? How about going soul winning at the bank? How about just your life is drawing souls unto Christ? How about going and winning the souls of your children, of your family, of your relatives? Do you know what that takes? That takes having a walk that talks. And that's the problem that a lot of us will have, and a lot of us can do, is that we can go to a door, and I can straighten my tie, and be a good person, that, that person doesn't know me from Adam, and be like, hi, hi, Brother Josh from Sound Words Baptist Church. How would you like me to show you how to go to heaven? And then you walk away, and you're like, brr, 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 brr. fight with your family, fight, you know, you're just, you're, just you're, you're not having the same spirit. But if you have the heart that first believes on Christ, loves Christ, you're a well-rounded Christian that's raising your family right, that's encouraging your church right, that's ministering in your church right, that's just being a well-rounded, a perfect believer like Job was. Remember, he was giving offerings unto people that, that had no idea he was giving offerings. There was so much going on in the, in the life of Job. He was taking care of people. The Bible records that he was the one that people came to when they were hurting and they were harming. He had the advice for them. He was the one that encouraged his neighbors. He was the one that loved his family. He was, he was the well-rounded Christian. And if we, neg if we negate all of that, the first love being believing in the commandments of God and appropriating them in order that you could walk in the truths of God, then what you have is a vain truth in the flesh which is easy soul winning is the easy part it's easy to stand at a door in front of a complete stranger right once you get over the nerves understood but once you get over that that's the easy part the hard part of the christian life is doing that the other 365 days of the year right we stand at a door for three hours and we think that that's the first words that's the first labor how about the rest of the time when you're not standing at a door just living the christian life that's the challenge prayer without ceasing Everyone's falling short of that one. I know we are, right? I'm falling short of that one. How about how about uh, love your neighbor? How about how about all the general and bigger commandments that all surround the perfect believer on Christ? What does Christian mean? 
Christ follower? How about, the, how about the miracles, the healings, the helps? The Bible records that Jesus went about doing good. Who's doing that every day? How about love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength? <laughs> right? That's where we're falling short. Those first works, if we just say, that's sowing, anyone can do that. I've seen, I've seen people, big fat phonies, go sowing on a regular basis. Hold up their numbers, pat themselves on the back, get accolades. <clears throat> Christian life is so much more, and that is the first love. That is the first works. Living a balanced Christian life, trusting in Him and not trusting in myself. So the question then will be posed then to that angel Are you trusting the Word at this time, or are you trusting in your own words? Are you trusting in the Spirit, or are you trusting in your own charisma and skills? Are you trusting in God, or are you trusting in self? We can ask all these inner reflection type of questions. And by default, He was supposed to take this message as it applied to Him and stretch it out unto His people. To the church, he says, hey, your first love has to be Jesus. Your first, first works have to be believing on the Father. Lest we think that we have made ourselves through our own works, through our own labor, through our own patience, through our own judgment. You see how there's that, so, that sobriety that comes? See how there's that humility that comes upon people when they realize that, hey, my works that I have done that were just lifts, they had nothing to do with me. It has to do with the fact that I was following, at that time, my first love and doing the first works was simply faith in God. And now I'm doing those works and they mean nothing. And so God's here saying, hey, wake up, repent, get back to the first works, get back to the first love. It's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. And this applies to everybody. He says, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of this place except thou repent. So the specific commands and, and exhortation and encouragement was given solely to the angel. But now he says, if you don't repent, I will remove thy candlestick. Well, what's that? The church. So the church will be destroyed if the preacher doesn't get these things right. What does he need to get right? Well, he needs to walk the Christian walk, talk the Christian walk, do the first love by having faith in God and exhibiting the first works as he works through them. And that is how the responsibility of the leadership, the angel, comes upon the church. And this is why, again, it's, it's, it's dangerous for the person that's like, yeah, I'm a great soul owner. But they're either not in church because they don't have that, that dome of protection being the angel over top of them. But also... There's the danger where you just go to any church and just punch in, do your clock, but you're soul winning all the time. You're showing everybody on Facebook how good you are. But you're just going to punch the clock at just any old church, just for any old reason, just because now I, I, need, to, I need to get my, my Christian bug. I need to do my Christian needle. I need, to, I, need to, I need to get my Christian pill and go to watch it, whatever church. And now you're under somebody who has no idea about what the well-rounded Christian life would be. And therefore, the dome of protection over top of you is now subsided to something where you are in danger of having that same candlestick removed out from under you. And when a candle is blown out, imagine what that happens. Imagine what happens to the little lights that are around that thing. Verse 6, again, this is going to just round it out. It says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deed of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So again, he's going to give him a positive. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. This is somebody that would rule over, that would be a king over the laity, the Nicolaitans, right? There, there is somebody that is lording over. And we've all experienced this, is that when preachers will lord over, when angels will lord over a congregation. And here, the angel of the church of Ephesus, he says, I, I'm opposed to this. I'm in, I'm in condemnation of this same thing. So as unto the angel then, so unto the church. Hey, there's no king ruling over you. There's no angel over and he's up here and you're down here. No, everybody has the same plan. It's just some of us have different responsibilities. And that's what each and every one of us needs to understand is that we're responsible for ourselves unto God. We need to go into the place where he has placed us and live the full Christian life there and fall into the roles that he gave us. And again, just, just to highlight it again, okay, so the 
preacher, the angel, he has these come upon him. Repent and get it right, or else the laity will suffer for it. The deeds of the Nicolaitans, in other words, having two separate groups, I hate those. So you're all the same in this context. And just to make sure it's clear that this message, though, though it was directed at the angel of the church of Ephesus, was directed unto all, verse 7, He that hath an ear. Do you have one today? Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And overcoming is done how? Believing. Believing. It all comes full circle. Isn't that amazing how the Bible does that? Can't make this stuff up. Heavenly Father.